Good afternoon. Thanks for being here this afternoon at uh, a panel which, for many of you, does not seem to be really related to the central focus of INET. But let me just ask you, how many of you have read Martin Wolf's book, Fixing Global Finance? You need to. Midway through the book, Martin Wolf, as he does in many, many things, makes a connection between central bank low interest rate policies and other aspects of economic activity. And what he points out is that low interest rate policies tend to amplify the financial activities of companies where transactions are involved, but results in a, an underinvestment in infrastructure and human capital. If it's indeed the case that human capital has been underinvested in for a long period of time, this may account for a portion of the inequality that is of considerable concern to people in the room. Today, we have a remarkable panel to talk about these issues. Anurag Behar from India, Roger Benjamin, the Council for uh, Aid ed to Education, James Heckman, well-known Nobel Prize winner, um, University of Chicago, Richard Reeves, at the Brookings Institution, and the panel will be moderated by Perry, Perry Merleys. I could hand this microphone to any of you in this room and ask you to say a few words about the banking sector. Because you have, this is a familiar concept, you have a lot of vocabulary about it, you could talk for five minutes without problem. If I ask you to do the same thing with respect to the auto industry, it might not be your subject of uh, familiarity, but you could speak for five minutes or so because basically the subject, the product, the uh, issues of automobiles are something you're familiar with. And you understand it as a sector. If I ask you to speak for five minutes about the youth human capital sector, you would um, struggle with ideas about um, education. You might have some things to say about safety, that sort of thing. But you'd basically be unable to talk about the youth human capital sector in the same way that you talk about, the, say, the financial sector. Yet, 18-year-old young adults ready for life are the most important product our society produces. You can't imagine finance or automobiles or any other economic sector functioning for a long period of time. You can't imagine a society without ready for life 18-year-olds. It's for this reason that INET has focused a tremendous amount of energy and resources on youth human capital development. The Human Capital Economic Opportunity Working Group with over 400 members worldwide is looking at this question, at these questions, and this idea of how do you produce ready for life 18 year olds. And now the question is, is it a problem? How are we doing? A Defense Department study in 2008 revealed that 75% of 18 to 24 year olds in the United States are not qualified to be a United States Army private because they either don't have a high school degree, they lack physical capabilities, asthma, diabetes, they have a criminal record, or they have a persistent uh, drug dependency. This large population of young adults who are not qualified to be United States Army privates are the same people who can't qualify to get jobs in the United States. And why it is that we have a consistent, steady uh, millions of job openings that can't be filled. So when you ask, well, how is the United States doing? in its youth human capital production, the you and might as well ask yourself, how many of you would put your money in a bank in which there was a 75% probability in which you wouldn't get the money back? Or how many would you would get into an airplane in which there was a 75% probability? These levels of quality, in, of um, lack of quality, are not tolerated in any sector except in the youth human capital sector. And one of the things that INET is about 
What the, U the Human Capital and Economic Opportunity Working Group is about is to change that in the United States. What's very important from the speakers that you'll hear, particularly um, uh, from India, Anurag Bahar, he will be talking about a population of young people that is larger than the entire population of the United States. The population of people under 25 years old is larger than the entire population of the United States. The voting population of India is larger than the population of the United States and, and, and Europe combined. So as you think about um, what INET is doing, what the Human Capital and Economic Opportunity Working Group is doing, think about this enormous pool of human capital in India, obviously China, the rest of the emerging economies. Think about this enormous pool of human capital that is going to be what sustains human society in the decades to come. So let me uh, now ask the panel to come on. Perry, lead them on. And I will get off the stage. Thank you. Um, no, here, let me sit there and you can sit there. Okay. And here. Um, well, thanks for that, that setup. There doesn't leave me much to say here. Um, I will just uh, say, remind you that I'm in this industry of, of education and human development. I'm a professor in a liberal arts college, uh, Barnard College, and my thesis students, okay, um, who are watching now, I hope, um, remember that your thesis is due April 21, and you should be working, working now developing your human capital. Um, this, I think of, is actually one of the most high-value-added pieces of teaching um, that we do. Uh, as, a, as a matter of fact, and perhaps we'll come to some of that in the, in the discussion. So I, I'm just admitting I'm in the selective school part. You'll see why that's, that's relevant when you hear uh, Mr. Benjamin's speech. But let's start it off with Jim Heckman, if you would. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much, Rob and Perry, for the introductions. Uh, I want to talk briefly about framing the question and then broadening the question, as Rob has already mentioned. Perry has mentioned, to consider these issues not just in the context of the United States or North America, but to consider a uh, broader set of contexts. So I just want to lay out uh, some, uh, I have, uh, here we are. So what are the challenges? And this is the challenge that uh, INET is addressing in a number of sessions and in different aspects. The challenges are basically economic inequality and a divided society. We know this is a graph that has actually gone around the world. Uh, it's turned up again since the 2008 meltdown. And we know that there's been a huge amount of growth of inequality in the society. But the question is, what should we do about it? And what are the appropriate policies? Now, the main point, and something that Rob already referred to, is that inequality is partly driven, not all exclusively driven. We know that there are important components of financial markets, other trends going on in technology and so forth. But skills is a huge component. And the question is how we can actually solve the skills problem, the very problem that Rob uh, very carefully discussed. This is a graph that I've drawn, uh, constructed, used in previous work on the uh, uh, production of skills in the American economy, the US economy. And namely, we've seen a very interesting phenomenon that until around 1950, we had a steady growth in every cohort. This is birth cohort on the bottom axis and the uh, completion rate on the, on the y, y axis, the uh, ordinate. And uh, what we see is that every cohort up to around 1950 was more likely to go to school, graduate high school, graduate college as well. And then starting for cohorts born after around 1950, there was a real slowdown. Now it's true it's at a high level, 80%. But more alarmingly, we've actually seen a decline in the economy uh, in terms of the percentage of high school graduates uh, starting in the late uh, 1970s, 1980s. And so this question about where the skilled labor are coming from, where the economy is going to actually build itself, and how we're going to actually grow is, uh, is the serious issue. Meanwhile, college graduation has been going up, although this is primarily driven by more women going to college. And the male graduation rate has not really changed all that much since the 1950s, the early 60s. 
So what we need to think about, and what this session will talk about in part, is a comprehensive approach to skills development. And I think that's what we need to think about in a way that usually is not framed in public policy discussions. And the crucial thing, and I think this is the most important thing I can leave you with, is that the kind of typical discussion of public policy for skills uh, is, is, doesn't work, the fragmented approach. So the obvious solution, for example, to promote skills is to put money in schools, maybe chartered schools, maybe trying to fix the high schools. What we want to understand is that skill formation is a much more general process, involves many other institutions and actors in societies, it involves families, it involves workplaces, it involves a much more integrated framework than we typically think about. And so much public policy is really sort of treating, treating the problem one, one solution at a time. So if we're going to try to promote health, we're going to try to have better doctors or better hospitals. That's part of the solution, but we need to think more comprehensively about an integrated solution. And I want to talk about that. And this, by the way, is relevant not just in the United States, but to India, to China, and to many other situations. And so the question is, broadly thinking, what do we know about skills and how they're produced? And I think the main lesson comes that we want to invest in prevention. So again, success depends on having a right bundle of skills. And notice the word is plural. It's not just a single skill. It's not just being smart. Even though many books have been written about how high IQ people are they going to win and all the other, the dummies are going to drop out, the world is much more complicated than that and multiple skills matter and the sorting of people, the actual use of comparative advantage as people find their ways through life and find the jobs where they can succeed, that I think is an important component, not only for understanding how we create skills, but evaluating programs that are creating skills. And another neglected component, which I mentioned already, but just would emphasize, is that families play a very important role. Families play a role not only in supporting children in schools, but in getting ready for uh, children for schools. So that there really is an issue that really needs uh, a broadened conception. So a skills policy also has to consider aspects of families and family life. And that varies across countries and environments, in not only in the United States, within the same country, but across many countries as well, which we'll talk about. A key theme, and Rob has talked about this already, and we'll hear more about it, is the importance of the early years. We know from a lot of work in neuroscience and developmental psychology and epi uh, epidemiology, the early years are very important. And they're more important than we realized maybe 10 or 15 years ago. We have not only a lot of evidence from biology, but we have a lot of evidence as well coming from uh, social science and social science interventions. So the key notion is multiple skills. So you want to think of both cognition and character. Now character is a word that sometimes is attacked. It suggests a kind of Victorian prudish notion. What I'm talking about as character is a sense of capabilities, the capacities to act, the ability to govern one's life, the ability to, to, to act in a variety of different areas in life, to manage one's health, to form, uh, to go to school and so forth. We want to think about these multiple capabilities, multiple measures of cognition, multiple measures of character that are developed from cognition, from conception to birth. And to think about the full life cycle. Instead of focusing just on the early years or focusing just on, uh, say, charter schools or focusing just on one segment of the life cycle to the other or maybe adult health if we think about treating disease, we really want to try to have a holistic approach that goes across the life cycle and connects the dots. Let me go in and give you an example. This is a graph. I'm not going to give you very many, but here's one. If you literally look at studies from social science where you ask, at age 30, what's the probability of being a college graduate? Exactly somebody who's going to contribute to society through, uh, say, college graduation and the set of skills that college graduates uh, contribute to. What we see, and these graphs are in the same format. On the left is cognitive factors. The other are measures of personality or character skills. And what you see is you move from the bottom deciles, which are the lowest levels, to the highest deciles. Those people who have higher levels of those abilities are actually much more likely to graduate from college. It's a very steep, uh, it's very sharp gradient that appears in both dimensions. But what's also relevant and I think is neglected, is that both factors, in some sense, in the sense of the slope of this curve, are equally important. And that, it's, and that these multiple dimensions are a key and neglected component of how we think about uh, evaluating schools and what schools and families produce. 
And so it's these multiple skills of producing them, developing, are going to be a major way to solve problems of economic and social uh, opportunity. And in a phrase that even I used last year, but I would repeat again this year, is that we want to think not just about redistributional policies, which has been the emphasis traditionally when people think about inequality, giving alms to the poor, trying to redistribute goods or a fixed pie. What we're talking about is creating a pie, and at the, a larger pie, and at the same time creating opportunity in doing that. So it's something that actually produces greater economic wealth and simultaneously produces greater opportunity in the lives of the people. And so I would view it as a policy of pre-distribution, early life distribution. So why is this important? And this is a graph that came out of work with Gene Brooks Gunn, who's working with us in one of the INET initiatives, the HCEO initiative on early childhood. And you can see that if you look at the scores of children who are uh, entering at the college age in the United States, say age 18, and you rank their scores on the basis of the education of their mother, you get a standard finding, which is people from greater advantaged families, more advantaged families are much more likely, the children are much more likely to have high test scores. And that's true for cognitive and non-cognitive measures both. This is a cognitive measure. But what's dramatically important is that these test scores that are so predictive in admissions, deciding who goes to college or not, the gaps in those scores are very substantial by age three. Certainly poor children enter school. And so those gaps are extraordinarily important in understanding where they come from. Now, 100 years ago, if we'd been talking about this question, I would imagine in Canada and England, eugenics movement would say, okay, this is purely a manifestation of genetics. What you're seeing is that dumb people have uh, dumb kids, smart people have smart kids, and the smart people go to school, so they just propagate. We've come to understand that that's a very limited vision. There is a role for genetics, but we also know there's a huge role for social policy. And I think that's what guides a lot of the work that we're doing in the HCEO network. And I'll give you one example. Many people are concerned about the gaps in American education between blacks and whites and Hispanics and whites. So if you look at the actual gaps, this is about 10 years old, this data, but if, if you look at this, you find that there's a serious deficiency in the percentage of children who are blacks compared to whites entering college. And the same thing is even worse for Hispanics. If you condition on the abilities of those individuals at age uh, 18, then you find that the gaps, because partly of affirmative action policies, other policies, those gaps reverse. And in fact, we're finding substantial uh, uh, benefits of blacks versus whites. So we can see, as, as one of many examples, the important role of these abilities. Now, how are these abilities produced? I talked about genetics, uh, a lot of people still talk about genetics. I don't want to emphasize that, but we know that family life plays a very important role. I'll give you some very simple examples. So in the American family situation, the US family situation, we see a phenomenon that's been very much remarked on. Increasingly, we see it mentioned in the New York Times and other popular media, but it's been around for many, many years. But what we see is a growing fraction of children who are living in single parent households. And these are single parent households in the United States context, which are not very rich in terms of financial resources and in terms of parenting resources. That's the biggest growth sector. And it's phenomenal how this growth. And this is a phenomenon that's actually found around the world. If you go to Taiwan, if you go to Korea, it's a much more limited level in Korea. Chile, you have in Mexico. This is a phenomenon that's global. What are these such environments that children have? Just to give you the simplest finding, it's something that's now been popularized by Hillary Clinton and also other groups recently, the so-called 30 million word gap. It goes back to some early studies by Hart and Risley. If you look at the kind of environments that children from different educational, from different professional backgrounds face, you can see that per hour, there are huge gaps in the verbal environments that children are getting. Professional children are getting exposed to more than 2,000 words per hour. Children from the bottom of in some sense of the socioeconomic strata are getting about a third to a fourth of that. And not only is it the quantity of words, it's also the nature of the parenting, which has been shown to be quite important. And so you get cumulative vocabulary differences, looking at my graph at age three, that are really quite staggering. And again, the environments play a role. And the reason why we know that's partly environment is that we know that we can do something about those environments. And we actually have a series of interventions which we're actively studying, not just in the US, but also now in China. We have an HCEO meeting actually next uh, week in, um, 
looking at planning a program, uh, a large scale program for the left behind, the 15 million left behind children in rural China. And uh, what's the finding from this work? Well, this is an American study. A lot of work has been done on this so-called Perry Preschool Program. The Obama administration has uh, touted these findings very heavily. The reason why they're so important is that we have long-term cost-benefit studies that survive very rigorous economic analyses. They, they account for the fact that, uh, you know, the tax cost of funds. Uh, Martin Feldstein would be very happy with these kinds of calculations. They're fully rigorous in the sense they count for what a good public finance economist would do. You get 7 to 10 percent rate of return per annum from this particular program. Now, how did the program work? The program works primarily by boosting non-cognitive skills. If you look at IQ, the typical focus in much of these early childhood programs or measures of cognition, you find that essentially even though children, when they enrolled in the program at age three, were no different, they're randomly assigned to treatment, by age 10, the treatment and control group children basically have the same IQ. Yet, those children are very successful in life. Something other than cognition matters. And the reason why I mention that is that in the whole study of education, we've gotten ourselves fixed on the notion that somehow the way we evaluate schools, the success of schools, even the success of whole nations, is through a test score. I'm delighted to inform you that I was at a participant in a conference just three weeks ago in Sao Paulo, Brazil, where the OECD, which is the primary promulgator of the PISA scores, went and said, okay, we're having a conference on the importance of these non-cognitive skills. And they now, not only do we know that they're very important in predicting a variety of life outcomes, but we have accurate ways to measure them. And so we can have a much more comprehensive inventory about what it is, which institutions work, and which skills are important for which stay and which ones can be most effectively developed over the life cycle. Let me just talk about something that sounds off the wall. You know, we're thinking about an educational intervention, early life children, early lives of children. This is another program very closely related to the Perry program called the ABC program. I'm giving you some results that were published in Science a couple of weeks ago. So what happens if we take these children, who are actually all disadvantaged children, we randomly assign them and follow them up, in this case, to age 35. The Perry results have been followed up to age 40. They're currently being followed up in an HCEO project to age 50. So what is the effect of this on health? Just look at the health outcomes. If we compare those people who got the treatment, remember these are randomly assigned, and we look at a measure of health, which really wasn't even on the table. People, what, what does early childhood have to do with health? Well, it has a lot to do with health. So if you look, for example, some of you are probably at the, at the region where you're worried about the 140 level in terms of uh, systolic blood pressure or the diastolic levels. You will see that at age 35, the controls who don't get any treatment are kind of above the threshold of 140 at risk. And they're very young to be at risk. Similar with diastolic pressure, prehypertension. If you look at a variety of measures, including risk factors for diabetes and all kinds of cardiovascular risk, there are substantial differences in improvements in health. What's the mechanism? This wasn't overtly a health program. They got a little bit of health screening. What was it? It was these social and emotional, these non-cognitive skills that gave these children the capacities to manage their own lives, they went to school, they acquire education, they acquire measures of self-control that translate across policy. And this is what I mean by looking not just at fragmented solutions, but understanding that there may be a good health policy, and this is now coming to be understood, a good health policy is also a policy that actually starts in the early years, that pre-distributes and it actually creates preconditions. So there's a dynamics here, and I think Richard will talk about this, I hope so, because <laughs> I've run out of time. Uh, where we actually think about the formation of these skills and where these skills involve and in, in engage each other in a symbiotic, synergistic way. And when we think about not only evaluating programs but how we produce the skills, we know that for different skills, different strategies, different interventions matter and are effective at different stages of the life cycle. Now, later life remediation is generally less effective. That doesn't mean there aren't very good strategies later life. And what do we know about that? Well, we know that early development's important, and I'll give you an example about the disparities in education. If you were to look 
as many people do. Just the ordinary return to education. This is from data, uh, from British data. And if you look at the height of this bar, you'll find that the total return, what's normally printed in newspapers, is, the, is, is this orange portion plus the blue portion. And that's what normally what people would say would be the effect of education. Now, if you decompose that into factors that are due to early life factors and those that are actually due to the causal effect of education, that's the part that's in the orange, you'll see very strong causal effects. There's a very powerful argument for promoting education. But at the same time, you'll also see very powerful role for early life factors that are actually contributing to that, fact, to that component. So the early investments are important. Understanding the life cycle is very important. And let me just conclude by talking about effective adolescent interventions. So many people, there's a thought out there that early life analyses focus and say it's all over by age three, it's all over by age five, and that's crazy. What's happened though, there's a common currency. There's a common notion about what successful interventions are. And whether or not it's in the US or whether it's in Colombia or Bangladesh, what we actually understand is that effective interventions involve typically a form of enriched parenting. So if you look at challenged family lives, you can see that by supplementing the family life of the child, by actually encouraging the mother to engage, I haven't time to show this, but many of the most successful interventions are affecting the actual relationship between the mother and the child, or whoever the caregiver is, typically the mother, and in a lasting way that creates a different dynamics, a different interaction. It's what the developmental psychologists for decades have called scaffolding, and that improves the capacity of the children. So let me just conclude by saying that this is a worldwide uh, issue. This is not just a problem unique to the United States. I've given you data to the United States because we've actually collected a lot of it there. Increasingly, data are being collected around the world. But in addition, we can see that when you look at the problems in rural China, and I would argue in India as well, that we will see that, again, with a modification of this kind of story, early intervention plays a very important role. But what have we learned? In, in India and in China and in Jamaica, we find something that's not present so much in North America, and that is nutritional interventions are very important. They're very serious issues in terms of deficiencies in micro and macronutrients. What we've come to understand, though, is if we only supplement those micro and macronutrients, there are some effects. The really strong effects come from a combination of early life supplementation where early life nutrients make a huge difference. A shortage of iron, a shortage of vitamin A have serious lifetime consequences. But on top of that, providing this kind of social and emotional regulation. When you do that, you find the interventions are much more successful. We have a series of experimental studies done in Jamaica. So I, uh, I hope that uh, we will return to these themes in the course of our discussion. And thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. Thank, thanks, Jim. And, and now we have uh, Roger Benjamin, who's going to take it uh, to the post-secondary level. Thank you very much. That was uh, a wonderful framing uh, exercise of the uh, uh, overall uh, set of questions we face. Um, there's obviously a great deal to debate and discuss about uh, the relationship between education and economic development. Um, I'm just going to focus here uh, on a set of issues regarding the absence of a level playing field from the college to career space uh, that I'm going to try to show is a, a significant practical problem that if we solve can uh, add some uh, benefits. We do know that um, a degree from a selective college of prestige grants students uh, greater advantages in securing gainful employment in a, in a uh, position that adds uh, greater lifetime earnings. Uh, it's also the case, of course, to remind ourselves that post-secondary education is the principal, a principal uh, uh, source of uh, creating human capital, preserving it and enhancing it, and of course, is the principal source for talent uh, for employers. Um, if, in fact, uh, there are significant bottlenecks that prevent or block equal opportunity for uh, students who go to less selective colleges uh, that are deemed to have high ability, uh, this really could signal that there's a mal 
uh, uh, distribution of human capital at the national level and that many students don't have a level playing field when they leave college uh, and go to work. Uh, practically, what we're dealing with are a couple of questions like this. Uh, what if, in fact, the selective, most prestigious colleges don't have enough places to accommodate all the students of high ability? Uh, what if, in fact, a majority of students of potential high ability to go to college do well, graduate, but employers, in fact, ignore them because they don't know where to find them? Now here, uh, I'm using the term selective college and uh, less selective colleges the way Barron's does in its annual uh, review. Uh, and high ability, I'm going to define a little bit later uh, as uh, being the, the test scores in three, uh, uh, three standardized tests that have been used for the past 15 year, years in the uh, graduating senior uh, space. Uh, I'm using the term equality in terms of equal opportunity and not uh, uh, equality of results. see here. Here's uh, my thesis, uh, succinctly uh, put, employers don't have enough information to make informed decisions about who to interview. Uh, they also uh, don't have, they don't have enough, uh, 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 students don't have uh, enough uh, opportunities to uh, interview with uh, employers that uh, present them with jobs that are really uh, aligned with the skills that they actually have. Um, the reason for this is elite branding. Uh, um, in the absence of more precise metrics, we use prestige as a proxy for quality, uh, at least in the United States. Um, we used to have grades, of course, as a good signal, uh, but actually now uh, in the United States, the mean cumulative GPA for graduating seniors nationally is 3.3 on a four-point scale, uh, so as Perry said earlier, everybody lives in Lake Wobegon, uh, and uh, they can't uh, be used effectively by employers uh, to make decisions about who to interview. The result of all this uh, is you really have a uh, small group of selective colleges uh, that form what really is a positional good that inordinately become the gatekeepers for all of the uh, chances for all students uh, in the economy uh, over their lifetime of employment. And I think that is uh, a fairly significant problem if it's uh, verified or corroborated uh, that warrants the term maldistribution uh, of, uh, of our human capital. Now, uh, I'm using uh, one uh, test that I'm associated with here to, to use uh, as a way to validate uh, the test, uh, validate uh, this market failure problem. There are several uh, tests, one by ETS, uh, one by uh, ACT, uh, and one that uh, I just happen to be associated with that are used um, to evaluate critical thinking skills that employers uh, all agree are essential prerequisites, uh, not sufficient, but prerequisite for uh, successful uh, of success in the, in the economic uh, uh, workplace. These are core cognitive skills. Uh, not, not all of the skills uh, that uh, Jim uh, uh, talked about. Um, this test has been used, uh, as is suggested here, in the United States and uh, about 12 countries. It and other tests have been used to evaluate uh, the question about how colleges vary in terms of how much value they add to student learning growth. You see the results here. It does matter a lot where you go to college. Uh, and of course, it matters uh, a, a good deal. Now here, then, uh, is a, uh, a, uh, a graph that projects the uh, uh, CLA performance uh, in selective versus non-selective non colleges. It's actually based, this is a national estimate. <clears throat> right now, there are about 940,000 students in the United States in these 143 selective colleges, and then uh, uh, 9.8 million in all the rest. Um, and uh, these percentage, th these, this breakdown is based on the percentages uh, that actually occurred in the last couple of test administrations with the CLA, which tests about 200 
colleges a year that's roughly reflective of the, um, of the Carnegie classification. Uh, this does show uh, that in fact there are greater percentages in the selective colleges that are in the top 10 percent or top 25 percent, but in absolute numbers it's 375,000 to about 140,000 in the top 25 percent. There are lots of students in these less selective colleges um, that in fact seem to have skills, or I'll just pause it right now, apparently have uh, skills uh, that are comparable to their counterparts in the highly selective colleges. So the recommendations, uh, oh, one more slide. Uh, remember Jim's uh, interesting uh, chart about the United States uh, test score allocation. Here you have the location uh, of these uh, selective colleges, and it's primarily in the northeast corridor of the U.S., um, and that shows that there's essentially a, a, ge a ge geographical disconnect between the uh, selective colleges and where all the students now live and where the growth is co occurring in the United States. Most of the selective colleges were born before 1900, uh, when the population of the U.S. was less than 100 million. Now it's 325 million, and there'll be another 80 or 90 million uh, uh, joining the country over the next few uh, decades. The recommendation then uh, is uh, to, in fact, uh, develop and use tools uh, that can provide demonstration of skills that are important for employers and students alike uh, and make that information accessible uh, to both. Um, the proposal then is to use uh, a, or develop an assessment in this college to career space that has some of the characteristics of the tests that are already out there um, and use it as a pre-screening tool or a sourcing tool for employers, not as something like a hiring decision uh, at all, uh, but as a, an essential additional piece of information that employers can use. Uh, this graph shows, or this figure shows how uh, we envisage uh, at, at CAE, you might be able to, in fact, narrow the, the uh, information gap between employers and students by educational technology partners. Um, there's a career fair, uh, virtual career fair, for example, now uh, that we're going to have in which employers are going to be coming uh, and they're going to know that they're going to be introduced to students in that top 10% um, uh, in terms of the CLA. Uh, and they're pleased to uh, come, uh, much less time and cost is, is, uh, is uh, uh, expended uh, uh, because of that. What's the result if this, if this kind of thing begins to work? Um, it is a more transparent market uh, uh, that's more efficient for both buyers and sellers, the students uh, and the employers at this point, and I think this would in fact um, uh, result in a better distribution of human capital uh, and uh, a, a somewhat more level playing field. This problem, again, is not uh, isolated to the United States, um, and I think it's extremely important. The principle of equal opportunity is core in liberal democracies, and if it's fraying or declining in this career to, uh, in this college to career space, uh, it's something to, to, uh, to, uh, to think about seriously and do something about, particularly since it seems to be the case uh, that there are a lot more students uh, of really uh, high ability that actually are out there in these less selective colleges. Thank you. Thank you, Roger. Thank you, and now I call up um, to extend the discussion to the case of India. Um, Anurag Bihar. Thanks, Betty. Good afternoon. Pleasure to be here with you, uh, with such a distinguished panel. Uh, I am going to talk about India, and in particular about school education in India as a case in point in the context of this, uh, this topic. Uh, when I say school education, I mean grade 1 through 12. Uh, my remarks will be in three parts. Uh, the first part is a brief description of the Indian schooling system, because that sort of sets the context. 
the second part is one key question about uh, the Indian education system. And the sec third part uh, is a second key question. So let me start with a brief description of the Indian schooling system. As you would expect, uh, a country like India has an enormous schooling system. It has uh, 205 million children in about 1.5 million schools. Uh, about 7 million teachers and other education functionaries are involved in the system. So it's a, it's a huge schooling system. Uh, it's not surprising. It's reflective of the size of the country. It's also not surprising that this schooling system is enormously diverse uh, and also very complex. It's merely reflective of the kind of diversity and complexity that is there in India. So if you look at languages, there are perhaps about 22 official languages of instruction. And that's not reflective adequately of the reality that in the classroom, so in a classroom, while you'll have one language as the medium of instruction, however, inside the classroom you might still have 10 languages, and a large percentage of the kids in the classroom may not really understand the medium of instruction. That's the linguistic diversity of India. And you look at other dimensions, you look at caste, socioeconomic diversity, regional migrancy. It's just an extremely diverse schooling system, an extremely diverse class. But like I said, it's not surprising, but that's the way India is. But there's one particular kind of complexity in the Indian schooling system, which is really an implication of a policy choice that we made long ago. And that implication is that our schools are very small. The average school size, I mean, you can sort of just look at the rough numbers, 205 million children across about 1.5 million schools, is just about 70 kids. What that means is that very often, every teacher is dealing with multiple grades at the same point in time. So you have this enormous system, complex and diverse, with this challenge of multi-grade teaching to almost every teacher. Now, I've sort of given you a, an overview of the Indian schooling system. Now, what's most well known about the Indian schooling system is that the outcomes of schooling, the outcomes of schooling, learning outcomes mostly, inclusion, and school completion rates are very poor. So if you look at learning outcomes in the Indian schooling system, uh, if you look, depending on the survey that you look at, uh, about 30 to 50 percent, about 30 to 50 percent kids in grade five cannot do language and math, which is expected of grade two. Inclusion is better than a few years ago, but it's nowhere we, where we want it to be. And school completion rates are very poor. So you have this enormous, complex, diverse system with poor schooling outcomes. Now, I must remind you that when I talked about learning outcomes, I've taken a very narrow definition, and I think Jim talked about it. That's an inadequate understanding of education if you just look at language and math. But let's just stay with that. Now, very often, because of this characteristic of poor, poor, poor schooling outcomes, the Indian schooling system is called as a broken schooling system. And I think that's an inaccurate description a fairly inaccurate description of the Indian schooling system. I don't think it's a broken schooling system. And the reason I say that is that if you look at it at a point in time, it does seem broken. But if you look at the trajectory, the trajectory of the Indian schooling system, I think we have made tremendous progress over the past 25, 30 odd years. If you go back to the mid 80s, only 50, 55% of the kids in India were going to school. Today, that number is 99%. What does it mean? If our enrollment numbers, which means school, kids in schools, had remained stuck where they were in the early mid-80s, 100 million children would have been outside school today. So in the past 25, 30 odd years, we have made enormous progress on enrollment, getting kids inside school. We made another kind of a progress. And that progress, which is even less visible, is uh, in the way our curriculum thinking has moved. In brief, our curriculum thinking, our curriculum goals, our curricular frameworks have moved in a very positive, progressive direction. And I think that's a very significant achievement. So now, you have a brief description of this complex, diverse schooling system that India has. And the most important, the most visible characteristic of which is the schools 
are places where kids are not learning. That takes me to the second part of my remarks. The second part of my remarks really relates to the most obvious question. What does need to be done such that children learn in school? Because if they're not learning in school, what are they doing? And that's the most obvious question about the Indian schooling system. It's now there, kids are in school, how do they learn? Now it appears that in the past 10, 15 odd years, we as a country have come to a belief, have come to a conclusion that we have a solution for this question. And that solution is that let's hand over the schooling system to the market, to the private sector. That's quite remarkable. And let me give you a number. Fully 30%, 30% of Indian kids go to private schools. Most of these private schools are for-profit private schools. Uh, if you were to look at comparable numbers across nations, no country, I'll repeat that, no country has that percentage of kids going to private schools and that to for-profit private schools, other than failed states. So we've, we've come to sort of a, a strange belief that the private schooling system and markets will somehow fix our schooling problem. And let's look at the reality. And the reality is this, that if you really control for socioeconomic background of parents, households, the learning outcomes in private schools and public schools are identical. And in fact, if you sort of expand the notion of education a little bit beyond math and language, and if you look at other notions of well-being, other skills, other abilities, I would contend that the public schooling system is doing a better job. However, the popular narrative is so much in grip with the idea of a market society that we think that we are solving the problem by actually handing over a schooling system to the markets. There's another interesting, very interesting trend. It's in the past 10 odd years that the private school enrollments have gone up from about 17, 18% to the now 30%. So in about 10 years, from about 16, 17% to about 30%. In that same period of 10 years, the learning outcomes, and again, now narrowly defined, in that same 10 years, learning outcomes have declined steadily. They have declined across the public education system, and they have declined across the private schooling system. So to me, the key question, the key question that faces us in our country is how do we improve schooling? How do we improve schooling? Because handing it over to the markets, the private schooling system is not doing its job. In fact, if anything, it's highly regressive. And we need to ask that question of ourselves again and again. And I think that's, in the Indian context, perhaps the key question in the context of school education. And you know, I don't have the time to go into it, but the answer or the set of answers are fairly simple, which is around, we have to revive our public education system. That takes me to the third part of my remarks. That is, that's a very basic question. It's a very basic question about education. And that question is, and certainly in the Indian context, what is good education? And we, in my country, we tend to believe that that question is sort of settled. It is answered, we have agreed on that. And that idea of good education or the aim of education in our country seems to be uh, you know, developing the autonomous individual, developing a, a just, equitable, humane, democratic society. And that seems to be the notion of good education. We must remember that this notion of good education arises from a certain commitment that my country made in its constitution about 50, 60 odd years. The idea of India, as we envisioned 50, 60 years ago, and it got sort of concretized in our constitution, that is somehow informing our notion of good education. And so we think that this question is sort of settled. It's done with. What we do not recognize, and I think we need to ask that question again and again for ourselves, that this is far from the reality. It's far from reality because of two reasons. First, this idea of education linked so closely to that idea of India while it is true on paper 
there's a massive gap between what's there on paper and what's happening in the schools. And how does one bridge from that idea of education, that worthy goal of education, to the reality as is practiced on the ground is a question, is an issue that we need to deeply engage with. Second, and I think, and I think this is perhaps at the core of this issue of good education, and which is this, that this idea of India, which is informing this aim of education, which is democratic, just, equitable society, that idea of India itself is highly contested. It might be there in our constitution, but on the ground, each of those ideas, what is justice? Justice for whom? Democracy, who is included in the democracy? Each of these ideas are deeply contested. And if we do not recognize that, and if we do not engage with that, then that notion of good education is actually very fragile, very, very fragile. So, as much as today, a key question for school education in India is, how do we improve learning? The second key question, which we need to continually engage with, is what is good education? And I must end, uh, I think, uh, human after all. And in the context of education, uh, often the question, the question of good education will lead us to what is being human? And unless we answer that in the context of our society, I don't think we will do a good job of education. Thank you. I'll call up our final speaker, Richard Reeves, and then we'll have a good chance for some, some discussion. So get your questions ready. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, human after all, that was a lovely link. One of the things that makes us human is that we think about the future. And how we face the future has been a constant theme of this conference. Um, whether you end up like Sandel being more hopeful than optimistic, either way, you're thinking about the future. Uh, the sessions on innovation and radical uncertainty have been about how we think about the future. In fact, I went to the session on radical uncertainty and somebody introduced the idea of radical, radical uncertainty, which is kind of academic one-upmanship, I think. And the closest we get to saying we've really no idea at all. Uh, and then two nights ago, John Ralston Saul's wonderful lecture talked about empathy and consciousness. But the thing that stuck with me was when he said that immigrant is one of the most noble words in the language. Because an immigrant is somebody who has set out to create a different future for themselves, who has a vision of their future and maybe a future for their children, which they then actively and bravely sought to pursue. So this theme about how we perceive the future, our own future, individually and collectively, has seems to me to have run through uh, this conference. Or it may just be that I'm pretending that's the case in order to set up my presentation. But this idea of motivation, aspiration, I'm going to build, I think, on what Jim said. I'm going to try to anyway. Um, it's very important to what I'm going to talk about. So there's two quotes here. I'm from Brookings, so we have to be ruthlessly bipartisan. And we have uh, JFK and then George W. Bush. The central point being the same, which is that we can have inequalities in motivation as well as in skills, and that we can be segregated not only by class and by race, but also by aspiration. And so the divisions, the inequalities which we've been talking about are not only in skills and capacities, but also in aspirations and expectations that we have of ourselves and sometimes uh, of each other. And that's what I want to briefly talk about today. So to set up my framework, um, building on what Jim said, actually, is I tried to make a distinction here between skills and aspirations. So on the left-hand side are what I think Jim calls capacities to act, which is a lovely phrase, which I like. And capacities to act, uh, various skills, and they can be broken into cognitive skills and non-cognitive skills. And I'm working at Brookings on that at the moment. So you've got on the left-hand side these capacities to act, but on the right-hand side you've got the reasons to act. Right? You might have the car, you might have the engine, you might have the fuel in it, but do you have anywhere to go? Where are you trying to get to? And that's where aspirations comes in. Why would you deploy these capacities which have been developed? Um, and I then distinguish on that side between what I call vague hopes 
and active aspirations. Um, vague hopes are general untethered, wouldn't it be nice if kinds of aspirations, and active aspirations are concrete, specific, planned, worked for aspirations, kind of grounded. So I want to get a good education uh, versus I'm going to college and here's what I'm doing about it. But we can probably think about the difference in our own lives as well. So I'm going to lose some weight and become, do more exercise is a vague hope, right? Hands up who made a New Year's resolution. Hands up who made a New Year's resolution. I knew that there'd be no one here because we're all too rational, right? We've all read the behavioral economics. We know we're not going to do it. But we also know that we won't actually achieve that vague hope unless we build in some sort of commitment device. We turn it into an active aspiration. So you get a running partner or you join a club or you do whatever you have to do to turn that vague hope into an active aspiration. Here's the sort of self-helpy version of it. I no idea who this person is, but a colleague sent this to me to distinguish between these two things, between this kind of dream this idea, and then actually something that's more specific, more concrete, more crunchy, uh, which is an actual goal. Now, one of the things that's sometimes said in public discourse and in political discourse is that there's a gap, a values gap. Uh, I'm going to use US data here. Um, and that somehow there's a kind of culture gap in what people aspire to, what their values are. And I'm going to show, first of all, that that's not true. These are high school seniors. And we're asking them how important they think these various things are by socioeconomic status, a mixture of income and occupational background status, getting good education, being successful, etc. Basically, I'm going to skip through this fairly quickly in the interest of time, but what it's telling me is that basically people are aspiring to broadly the same things. The idea of having a good family life, getting good education, these are not controversial things. They are not, America, USA is not divided um, along those lines. Uh, here's another one uh, just uh, broken down by the mother's educational background. So this is high school seniors who say getting a good education is very important to them. And you can see it's flat. It doesn't make any difference uh, whether your mum dropped out of high school or has got a postgraduate degree. You think getting a good education is important. Now, that's a vague hope. That's a sort of, it would be nice to get uh, a good education. But then how does that actually turn into action, an active aspiration? I'll just give brief examples. So this is how much time you spend on homework. And what you'll see here is that if your parent went to college, you do a lot more homework um, than if they didn't. You're twice as likely to do two hours a day, for example. This is 15 to 18-year-olds. So it may just be their parents are sort of standing behind them, threatening them uh, if they don't do the homework, or maybe bribing them after what Michael said uh, last night. But the point is that actually getting good education is translating here into actually doing homework. I'm going to skip through some of these. Just a reminder, same graph. Getting good, good education is important to me. This is high school seniors and where they think they're going to go. These are their own expectations for college, um, or rather for education generally. What you see is that actually there's not much of a class gap in terms of the number of people who think they're going to get a college degree. That's misleading. Look to the right. And what that, the reason that's happening is because the top quartile by uh, family background uh, are planning to get a postgraduate degree. They've looked at the labor market. They've realized that a college degree doesn't cut it anymore. And more than 50% of them are already, as high school seniors, planning their postgraduate education. So in a sense, quite misleading. What you're seeing is a very, very different view on the grasp of the opportunities ahead of them and the planning that's going into them. So that's one example. Uh, I'll give you one more quick one. The vague hope of having children within uh, stable relationships within marriage, whether you agree or disagree with this statement. This is millennials, so it's uh, US um, under 30s. And they're asked whether or not they think single women should have uh, children, right? So just asking them. And what you find is the majority don't think single women should have children. Uh, and that's true across races. In fact, um, black millennials uh, are slightly less approving of single motherhood than uh, non-black um, white millennials are. OK, so that's a vague hope. It would be nice to have children with someone. and. And so on. And then an active aspiration would be how good are we at using contraception? Um, this is a survey which asks people whether or not they always use contraception with their current or previous sexual partner and by their own level of education. Uh, the conclusion is that none of us are very good at it. Um, there's a, uh, we're not very good at controlling our fertility uh, by, by comparison to the technology available to us. But there's a very big class gap. Um, by background in terms of uh, the efficacy of contraceptive use. Paula England, in a forthcoming paper, very usefully distinguishes between the aspiration to not get pregnant, to not have a child, and the efficacy to make that aspiration come true, which requires all kinds of skills, knowledges, and technologies, which do not appear to be evenly distributed uh, across the class distribution. Uh, the result is very high levels of unintended pregnancy generally, but especially among those with lower levels of education. So again, we share a vague hope, but it seems some of us are better at turning that into an active aspiration. Why? 
Why would some people end up with lower active aspirations than others? Four possible reasons. First is I generally just don't want it. I've thought about it. I do want to have a child of my own. I don't want to go to college. I'm in full possession of the information. Uh, I know the opportunity is there. I'm just choosing autonomously and individually not to take it. OK. We can't really have a problem with that. The second one is it's beyond my reach. I just, I'm not going to get it. So I'll lower my expectations to some extent. I won't apply to college because I don't really think I'm going to get in anyway. Um, and so you engage in what John Elster calls adaptive preference formation. You adapt your preferences to the circumstances, whether you correctly or incorrectly perceive them. And that's a very important point, because what that means is, to use the analogy, the playing field. The playing field shapes the player, as well as the player being on the playing field. And one of the ways it shapes the player is through the expectations and opportunities you see in front of you. My colleague Melissa Carney has found that teen pregnancy rates are higher in parts of the US where there are higher levels of inequality between the bottom and the middle. She claims that may be the result of a desperation effect, where actually when you realize you're not going anywhere anyway, the incentive to not become a teen parent is much less. So we should always remember that opportunities shape individuals as well as individuals shaping opportunities. Third, it's not for people like me. Uh, no, I don't want to go to college. People like me don't go to college. I don't want to become an economist um, because they're all 50-year-old white men, for example. Um, you know, uh, I don't think that it's the right way for someone like me to behave. Um, something about it just doesn't fit, right? People like me don't do things like that. Um, and then the last thing is I just didn't know about it. I wasn't aware that that was a possibility for me. So if, if I'm right, and that there are these class gaps not in vague hopes but in active aspirations, can we do anything about it? Assuming that we should, which I think we should. Well, uh, I'm not going to go into this in huge detail, but there are various policies which have specifically aimed at that. So the Upward Bound worked with kids who were thinking about going to college, and it managed to lift the, the number of college enrollments among those who previously had low expectations about going to college uh, from 18 to 38%. Can we change the idea that it's not for people like me? Well, if you're worried about the economics profession looking like lots of middle-aged white men, then obviously what, lots of prominent people who aren't middle-aged white men in positions of power. But my, one of my favorite examples was that a study looked at the way what the posters were on the wall of a science classroom at a college. And they found that if you just change the posters from the ones that all the blokes had put there, Star Trek posters and things like that, that there was a significant increase in the number of women who decided to carry on studying science. Because they looked around and they thought, well, it no longer just looked like something that slightly geeky men would do. It looked like something they might do as well. Tiny change. And of course, it's a trivial example, but let's think about vocational education versus college education. I'm always struck in DC policy circles that lots of people go on and on about how important vocational education is. Very few of them see it as something that's appropriate for their own children. It's not for people like me. So it works both ways. What, does, uh, people like me, what do people like me do? Um, I didn't know about it. Um, you'll probably know this work, but Caroline Hoxby and others have done work where they've taken the kids who were uh, high achieving, and what they did was they sent them for the cost of $7 a packet which told them about the colleges they could apply to and the financial aid that was available to them. It cost $7 a piece and significantly increased college applications by 19% and a better match as well between the abilities of the uh, lower income student and where they ended up. And so the simple fact of telling them about the opportunities in front of them massively increased their uh, levels of uh, application, which suggests to me that there was just simply a knowledge gap. So we can do things about it. Uh, there are specific policies that we could be putting in place which get at not only the capacities to act and the skill gaps, but on the other side of it, the motivation to act as well and the aspirations to act. And that seems to me to be a difficult area to get into, difficult empirically, diff difficult normatively, but if we're serious about inequality and we're serious about human capital, we have no choice but to go there too and to look at how aspirations, goals, and expectations, how I view my future self and class divides and how I view my future self are replicating levels of inequality. Because we're human, after all, we look to the future. But if we want more human equality, we must do a better job of making sure that more of us can actively shape that future as well. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, I think you'll agree with me. This is a pretty good panel. Um, as a money and finance guy, I, I've learned a lot uh, in, the, in the last hour. Um, and so uh, if we can start to have some questions, and as they get organized, I'll, I'll ask the first one, because we have over 30 minutes here. Um, what I kept coming back to is it seems to me like we know a lot and we got some good ideas. Um, why aren't we doing them? What, what, what stands in the way here? 
And if I could maybe just ask you all to respond briefly to that as we're, as we're going, going down the line, um, as people are getting lined up. Jim? Well, part of it. They'll, they'll do it, yes. They'll do it, okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think part of it is a knowledge gap. I think it really is a sense there are a lot of obsolete ideas out there. And there's a feeling, I think, among a lot of people that uh, human change is really not that possible. That, that let them, many people think things are fixed at birth. I don't want to say it's social Darwinism, but I think there's a lot of sense. We d people don't understand what I think has been produced, which is much greater understanding of how we can change and, and offer greater opportunities for people. So I think that's part of it. And that's mm. among you know, politicians, among uh, uh, leaders. So part of it's education. But part of it also goes against, and this is the point I didn't develop at length, but if, for example, in early childhood, there's a huge issue when you get to the nerve center of uh, the family life. The family is playing a huge role. We know the family plays a huge role in getting the kid ready for school, supporting the kid in school, even in the business of college applications and so forth. And so people, and, and, and this, this goes back, you know, one of the original early childhood programs was produ produced by Senator uh, Mondale back in the 1960s, late 60s. And uh, his idea was, you know, early childhood, some expanded form of Head Start. Richard Nixon vetoed it. And the reason why he vetoed it, he said, we really don't want to intrude on the life of the American family. And I think what people have been very sensitive about discussing is the importance of family life. You know, frequently the term is used blaming the victim and all kinds of things. But I think when we understand that most of these programs, most of these types of interventions, public or private, are not replacing the family, they're not attacking the family, they're supplementing the family. And they have to have a voluntaristic component. And they have to be individually adapted. I think that's been the, a huge issue for why early childhood programs. Various groups, if you look at the groups actually supporting early childhood in the United States, a lot of those are red state governors, uh, chambers of commerce, and their goal is actually family, trying to help and supplement family life. Mm -hmm. But that's so far not played out in the national mm -hmm. political scene. Mm -hmm. So that's... Uh, so I, I heard you saying our aspirations are vague and not active, um, uh, at least the first one. But uh, Roger, do you well, have thoughts? Uh, I, I, uh, I'm not the economist up here, but I did most of my work uh, under economists. Uh, and what I take from that, when you're thinking about institutions and things like post-secondary institutions, um, which, which was my topic, um, you really have to talk about incentives uh, and uh, the incentives that are needed to get the stakeholders involved in any particular policy system to change what they're doing. And when you're talking about post-secondary education uh, or any aspects of, of the educational system, that is a huge challenge. Uh, and it, it's got to be overcome either with positive incentives or serious outside pressure from uh, groups that are trying to affect uh, the kind of change that's needed mm -hmm. here. Thanks. All right. Why aren't why aren't why aren't uh, we doing better in India? So, uh, in fact, I would sort of uh, interpret that question, saying, if it's so clear, why is it that we are not investing into the public education system? Mm -hmm. you know? And I think uh, while there's a combination of issues involved, uh, two broad categories. One is uh, one is merely a question of money. It does require a huge amount of money, and the investment that we are making into our schooling system, the public education system, is uh, under 2% of G GDP. We need a lot more money, and therefore there's sort of a conspiracy of, uh, a conspiracy of convenience. Uh, there is no money to invest into the public education system, so let the private sector sort of take over, and let's see what happens. So I think there's uh, an issue of investment involved. The other one is, uh, I think, a far more interesting uh, uh, and even, even, more, even more complex issue, which is that uh, the public imagination, the social imagination, isn't so much in grip with the idea that market can solve all problems. And if you look at our recent history, uh, it's only in the early 90s that we sort of opened up our economy, uh, which was this uh, you know, fairly socialistic kind of economy, uh, to, let's say, freer markets. And I think that sort of captured the imagination of the country in such a manner that uh, the solution for everything seems to be the market. And I think that narrative to be, uh, you know, to be busted 
will take a while. Mm -hmm. Richard? So, uh, one of the least popular things I've written um, since I moved here was a piece for the Times uh, called The Glass Floor, and it was about the way that the elites make sure their own children are not downwardly mobile, um, even if they're not very bright. Um, uh, and I attack the legacy admissions uh, and so on. But I think one of the things that elites do very well is perpetuate their, the inequalities and pass it on to their own children. Uh, and I think that the inequality in the US is at such a point now that the elites control the opportunity structure so very effectively on behalf of their own children that trying to change that system runs you right up against the self-interest or at least the next generation's interest of the very elite that you're relying on to make those changes. And uh, it's just not good enough for us to say, oh, we can all be winners. The truth is that if we do get more high ability, low income kids into these elite schools, it means fewer of our kids who maybe aren't so able won't get into those schools. And that's a conversation which even at a conference like this can quickly get uncomfortable. We will, we, the elite will lose from a genuine move towards a more meritocratic society. That's why I think we're making no progress. Well, the, no, I, I think you've noticed all of these are different answers too. So this is the, we're 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 engaging now. So let me let me turn it out to the to the group. Where are the microphones? Wait, Eric. What? Can I ask a question? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, sure. I, I like to ask a question then, Eric. And this is the growth of the private sector in Indian education. I was recently in New Delhi, and I'm certainly no expert on India as you are. But one thing that was really striking was the extraordinarily high rate relative to the median income of teacher salaries in the public school system. And what was also interesting, and, and you said this in your talk, that the private schools and the public schools were roughly equally effective by a lot of the evaluations. But the private schools were much, much cheaper. And so I thought that part of the government policy was a way to bypass the very, you know, what seem to be rigid, high salary structure. That's kind of independent of the other issues. I'm not contesting anything you say, but it's a fact that, that struck me as very strange, because actually India, if you look at the measure that many people say about teacher salaries relative to the median, India is a great performer in, in having very high, but many people say that's just an example of a group taking control of the system, and, and in some sense, maybe there's an in, inefficient public sector and many people are pro hoping that the private sector can at least uh, remedy it. I'm curious what you think about that. Yeah, that's a, you know, that's a very interesting point. And very often when our, in our country, people say that, well, one of the issues with school education is teacher salaries are low. That's incorrect. Right. Teacher salaries are not low. However, I think one needs to go into one, one more level of detail, which is this, that if you look at the comparison of teacher salaries and public, teacher, public school teacher salaries, to median incomes across the country, perhaps that's not a very good comparison. What one might look at is that if you look at a village and if you look at the teacher's salary, how does her salary compare with that of, let's say, a postman or a nurse or a policeman, right? And they are more or less the same. So they are the front line of the public system, which is being paid more or less the same. And in that particular context, I don't think teacher salaries are uh, you know, inordinately high. So that's one issue. But, but there's a question. There's a general complaint, maybe the public sector is being overpaid. I mean, that, that's what I, the comment I heard. Uh, so the benchmark is even, but the, the whole thing is bad. So Jim, there's <laughs> another way, another question that one needs to ask, which is this, that if the teacher salaries were to be the same as that they are in the private schools, right? And the private school teacher salaries are very often uh, one third, one third of uh, public teacher school salaries. Right? right. If that were to happen, what kind of talent would teaching attract? Because people being attracted to the teaching profession, the teacher labor market is being driven by the salaries, driven by the public education system. The private teaching, sal private teacher salaries are really the tail end. You know, they're just sort of floating. They're just. Uh, uh, you know, on top of the public education system. So the entire teacher labor pool is really driven by the public salary. So it's a fairly complex situation. Uh, my summary is I think the teachers are fairly paid, fairly paid in the teaching profession in the public schooling system, and very unfairly paid in the private schooling system. So let's get some more people into this. There was a mic, you were right there? Yes, please. Yeah. 
I want to ask about uh, the issue that you could call BAs with baristas, in the sense that in Canada we've had significant growth in the number of people getting, say, a BA, but we've also had now a significant growth actually in the number of those people working you know, in coffee shops and so on, and actually the gap in income between high school only and BA only has shrunk in percentage terms. So what's happened is, as, you, as one of you pointed out, uh, the elites start to recognize, okay, now I need more than a BA, I need the next degree. And so in effect, while you can help any one individual by raising their education level, you still have sort of this role of education being used as a signaling mechanism or a sorting mechanism, and you don't necessarily create more high paid jobs. All you do is you actually, in effect, perhaps you end up with an excess allocation of resources to education because you're giving people more and more years of education to end up in the same uh, position. Somebody want to grab that? I'll take yeah. It. Well, I, I think there's one fallacy out there, at least in the American discussion, that, educate, that college education is for all. I think we know from many countries, and I think even our own country, we know if you look at some of the economic return, now there are other benefits to education than economic return, I grant you that. But if you look at the economic return to education for some of the less able children, college education, it's actually relatively low. And I think we might want to be much more creative in thinking about vocational education. Uh, Richard's already referred to the fact that that's already pretty much the buzz in Washington. But to think about community colleges and our own version of what might be thought of as a German apprenticeship system or mm -hmm. something that adapts uh, workplaces to the abilities, motivations of children and kind of responds to what's out there and would give children, and there's a huge demand for that. Many, I think there's a huge demand. Rob was talking about this earlier, Rob Duggar. So I, th I think the structure uh, is a little bit narrow in terms of focusing just on college. Richard? So I, I, it's certainly true that we can create graduates more quickly than we can create graduate jobs, so you'll get a mismatch. Mm -hmm. um, but I think part of the problem there is the expectations that are set around it. Um, getting a college degree or getting post-secondary education is not just about your market readiness. Um, surely it's about other things as well. It's about choice, it's about freedom, it's about literacy, it's about flourishing life. Um, so I think that's one thing. The second thing is that I, I agree with Jim about not everyone should go to college question, but it really worries me at the same time because what I'm afraid is going to happen is that we're going to make sure all our kids still go to college um, and, and use that as a signaling device of their elite status while all the kids of the poor um, get better quality vocational education than they're getting now. Now, I'm not saying they shouldn't get better vocational education, but I'll be more relaxed about that distinction when we don't see such yawning class gaps in current college entry and uh, graduation. So I'm worried that two-tier system will actually uh, calcify class divides rather than overcome them. Uh, uh, yes, Perry, just, just a just a quick uh, additional point, and I, and I like what Richard just said, but there, there's a growing movement in the states right now to move toward competency as the, uh, as the benchmark uh, in post-secondary education because there clearly has been a deterioration in the standards, uh, and that's not just uh, through standardized tests, but all kinds of surveys, and, 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 and mm -hmm. people are really uh, really worried uh, that the BA degree itself, the bachelor's degree, is, is no longer uh, really doing the job. And I disagree with uh, Jim about the, uh, the uh, importance of apprenticeship system as well as uh, Richard's uh, larger uh, framework. Um, so there are a lot of hands up now, so why don't, I, I suggest we take like three at a time now so we get more people in. Let's say here in the front row, because they're very eager and I can see them. One, two, three. Can we get the mics up here? Or maybe three, two, one, since the mic is here. Okay. okay. Jim. Uh, Jim. Yes, uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wander and see who else is having your hand up. Okay, so now I can see you. Okay, so you're a, next. There's a politician in your region of the country named... Paul Ryan, and he's taken your story and uh, politicized it. He says that the kids who go to school with a brown bag are more likely to succeed than kids who get public free lunches. Why? Because the brown bag shows that there's a parent that's interested in the child, and therefore they tend to succeed. Now, I don't think that's what comes out of your thing, but you have to be very careful about politicians not translating what we talk about academically 
into these kind of things. I think you would deny that. But the, the second thing is, I would ask you is, uh, since three is before public school starts at all, what about free pre-kindergarten education? After all, if you're a single parent, uh, you have to go out and earn a job. Your kid can't have very much parenting if you're earning an income. Should we be able, should the government provide some sort of pre-kindergarten, uh, not only food because of the nutrition value, but uh, the parenting value, such as the English in the old days had nannies who, who did these things. Could you just pass to Eric? Yeah. Thanks. Uh, in Michael Sandel's talk uh, last night, we talked about the increasing isolation of elites in society, that elites only mix with each other and are separated from the rest of society. There have been recent studies suggesting that assortative mating uh, is playing a growing role in inequality, that rich people only have babies with other rich people, poor people only have babies with other poor people, and that this is something that has changed, that there was more mixing uh, across uh, uh, class uh, lines uh, previously. So I'd be interested in views in A, is that true is, do you believe that research? And then B, if so, is there anything that can be done about it? It seems like something would be very hard for policy to intervene on. Thanks. Could you take? Please. Touches a bit on, touches a bit on the same uh, uh, subject, more for uh, Mr. Reeves. Uh, it's very nice to talk about uh, mobility and particularly relative mobility, but for anyone that goes up, you have to have someone that comes down, and particularly when you come down for the top, you need a lot of push, and probably taxes are not exactly enough. Shouldn't we let financial crises let their, run their course in order to obtain the sort of mobility that we would like? <laughs> okay, so I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna ask the, the panel to, you don't have to respond to all of them, or at any of them. Um, let's just run, run down the panel. Why don't you start in reverse I'll order? start from the reverse order. That's an yeah. excellent idea. Yes. Okay. Uh, yes. If Paul Ryan was saying that good parents matter for yeah. kids' outcomes, then he was saying something pretty uncontroversial. Um, the UK introduced universal pre-K for every three and four-year-old, and then uh, free pre-K for the bottom 40% of the income distribution, even as we cut everything else. And having been in the meetings where that decision was made in my previous role, I can tell you that the word Heckman was used quite a lot. Um, so it's either his fault or uh, his triumph. Um, that the UK has done exactly what you've said. Um, assortative mating, um, it, I, I, my read of the literature is that it hasn't changed, except to the extent that there are now a lot more women with whom you can assortatively mate. Uh, in other words, uh, there, if you're a, graduate, a college graduate male now, then there are lots of college graduate um, females that you can mate with. Um, so uh, it's, just, uh, it's possible now in a way that it wasn't before. Um, it doesn't contribute as much, I think, as some people say, to income inequality, but I think it contributes hugely to intergenerational immobility. It is a massive opportunity hoarding scheme. Um, it is a very, very good thing to do if you want your kids to do well, to marry somebody else, affluent, rich, well-educated, etc. As to what you can do about it, it's difficult to imagine a public policy to stop it. Um, but let's take one example. Assortative mating is much less effective in the African-American community in the US because there are so few well-educated black men with whom the well-educated black women can assortatively mate. And so yet another mechanism for racial inequality is reinforced. The solution to that is get more well-educated black men so that to the extent that marriages are still taking place on race lines, um, that uh, there's at least equal e racial equality in assortative mating. But you're right, that's just something that's beyond the reach of public policy, because let's deal with things that are within the reach of public policy and attempt to counteract it. And as for just letting the children of the financial crash crash um, uh, as a kind of positive move towards uh, downward mobility, would that it was so. Uh, actually, it seems that a lot of the wealth has recovered itself. Um, actually, downward mobility from the top 1% of the US income distribution is very low indeed. Uh, so we talk a lot about the 1%, but I'm interested in the kids of the 1%, and I can tell you, they don't fall very far. The opportunity hoarding mechanisms of the top 1% are alive and well. And all right, pass. Uh, here's an analogy. In the wake of World War II, uh, there were two policies that were uh, uh, developed and implemented. Uh, that created a middle class, upper middle class, uh, tremendous opening, uh, opened uh, opportunity structure, the GI Bill and the SAT. 
there were 16 million men coming back, and they wanted to go to college. They got the opportunity, and guess what? Uh, the opportunity structure really significantly increased. But again, it was for non-Hispanic whites. Well, we've got to do something today to shift and open up the positional good structure in my vocabulary that I talked about. It's not, it is not just the case that if, if groups are coming up, that means others are going down. In a country at least as large as the US, India, et cetera, you really have to uh, evolve uh, social mobility mechanisms uh, to account for the tremendous dem demographic changes that are occurring. So uh, just to take the questions uh, uh, more or less in order, in terms of Paul Ryan, I, I'm not a close follower of what he's saying, so I can't endorse or how he's using or misusing the work. Uh, I, I, I would say, though, that the idea of supporting family life early on is very important. Yeah. And, uh, and that would include even prenatal, before kids are born. I mean, the huge uh, amount of evidence uh, uh, suggesting the programs that essentially inform pregnant girls about health risks and how to parent can be very successful. I think those survive cost-benefit tests that, if Ryan were consistent, would actually be added to the budget. On the assortative mating question, I, I think there is some data, actually. I mean, the data would be from the OECD report. And if you look at the, the report called Divided We Stand, they estimated that about 10% of the growth in inequality, this is over the whole OECD, came from assortative mating. But th there's a little bit of a controversy whether you use the mating through education levels or through the earnings levels. There certainly seems to be the colleges, and in fact, some of the real economic return to education for women has actually been through sorting. And what's interesting is that the fact that high-income men are marrying high-income women and high-income and high-education women are working much more provides another kind of insurance in the market, which actually helps reduce inequality, provides a lot of insurance. And so I think that's it. I would talk about a point that's relevant, related in part, and I think this is what Richard was saying. I've done some studies on what are something called credit constraints. You know, you look at uh, who goes to college based on family income. The most striking finding is the dumb kids of rich parents are much, much more likely to go to college. And that's, a very, and that's completely consistent with everything. That's actually where the biggest change has been, actually. The, every, more people are going to college now than 25 years ago, but it's the dumb kids of rich parents. And, and what you actually see is a kind of paternalism, which is stronger. So the way that parents are interacting with the more educated parents, they're giving a quid pro quo. You get money for going to college. And that's very strong. And in terms of the financial crisis, we know that the Gini coefficient did decline somewhat around 2008 when rich people got wiped out, partly wiped out from the stock market. That's more or less uh, gone, however. So I, I don't know if that's going to be a permanent factor. Um, so let's get some mobility in the question answering here, in the back here. Uh, can we have, again, three? I think that worked pretty well. Can we have one, two, what am I saying, three? Yes. Um, I'm wondering if you would get rid of legacy admissions, and I'm also wondering if you would change the way local schools are funded uh, so that they're not dependent on local treasuries, which tend to reproduce income inequality, and I have a session mm -hmm. to go to really soon. Yes, please. Hi. I have a question about um, online education and the... the rise in MOOCs that we've seen over the last few years. And I've heard two arguments about this. One is that this is going to uh, flatten the playing field and give a huge amount of opportunities for people that didn't used to have access to this type of higher education. And the other argument is more of a general equilibrium type argument, which is that you know, over the years, as this becomes more firmly rooted as part of our education system, we're going to see more of a, a two-tier type of education. There's going to be the, the higher, low, higher education the way we have it, in-person people being able to go in there and have access to the teachers and one-on-one -on -one interaction. And then there's going to be the second tier of people that are gaining their education almost entirely on their own and through this um, online forum. I'm just curious if anyone has anything to say about how that's going to affect uh, inequality. I'd like to ask a rather different question. The basic aim of promoting skills is presumably to maximize human well-being. 
And in countries where the basic needs have been satisfied, there's a reasonable amount of evidence that material well-being has uh, been satisfied, but non-material goods uh, that arise from nurturing, affiliation, giving, um, also arise from uh, basic curiosity that is not linked to material goods, um, that that has received uh, less, uh, less emphasis. The skills required for these non-material goods that provide more of a sense of civic duty, a sense of promoting community care, are probably very different from the skills uh, that are required for material goods. Do you have any thoughts or evidence on that? Mm -hmm. I think there was somebody I called on back there. Yes, please. Yes. Um, the panel spoke briefly about uh, teacher pay, and I wanted to ask about the mismatch between the private returns to teachers and the social returns that their work generates. So I'm thinking of work by Jim Heckman and a recent paper by Raj Chetty, which show massive social returns to good teachers. So Raj Chetty's paper estimates that a good middle school teacher can generate $300,000 in future income, lifetime income, for a classroom that they teach. Um, meanwhile, teacher pay in Canada and the United States is about $30,000. So um, I guess I'd ask you, why do you think there is such a mismatch? And do you think there's something that should be done about it? OK, so this is a good range of questions. Uh, legacy admissions, MOOCs, uh, material versus non-material well-being, private and social returns. Richard, do you want to kick us off? Sure. Um, uh, legacy, legacy admissions uh, strike me as extraordinary. Uh, slap in the face of, of US ideas of meritocracy. The fact that they remain to this day. Uh, what's going on? Um, uh, of course, it'd sweep them away. Unbelievable, uh, most, along with most other things. The idea that you should get preference because your parents went there is so flagrantly anti-meritocratic that it's just simply morally unsustainable. Um, local funding, I don't actually, I used to agree with that argument about local funding. My read of the evidence is that actually funding in and of itself is not the, the thing that really contributes to, teach, to school quality except through teachers. What's actually happening is more of these neighborhood segregation effects, peer effects, um, quality of teaching effects, rather than the amount of money going into the schools. So it's more about those issues. Um, MOOCs, uh, you know what? Even if I watch Michael Sandel's whole justice course online, uh, and I tell an employer that I still didn't get into Harvard. And the thing that matters about having a Harvard degree is it tells everybody that I got into Harvard uh, and got out again. And so it's, <laughs> it's, the, it's the fact that this Harvard selection committee thought I was clever that matters, not the fact that I've learned anything. Um, although, of course, I will have learned a lot. Um, the point about uh, non-material and material well-being, I actually think that the skills that Jim works on, and I'm starting to work on around non-cognitive skills, actually probably are quite good for both material and non-material goods. You know, the ability to persist, to defer gratification, to focus on tasks is good for relationships and parenting, and it's good in the labor market too. So I think in the end, those skills probably are transferable across the last two domains. And the last thing it relates, I think, the education point on teacher pay. I agree with the Chetty data. I think the big problem is that the good teachers are with the kids who need them the least, i.e. like my kids and all of your kids, uh, in the nice schools out in the suburbs rather than in the tougher schools. When you can pay them more to get them into those schools, it does look like they can have quite an effect. The trouble is that you don't, there aren't that many teachers who want to do that except the very young idealistic ones. And so we should pay very much more to the very good teachers who are teaching the very disadvantaged um, kids, and we need to find a way to do that. But to do that, we'd have to break the teaching unions, probably. All right. Yep. So uh, sort of related comments, you know. One is uh, partly for that reason, I feel that uh, teacher pay, public school teacher pay uh, in India is sort of fair. Uh, but I must say that uh, school teachers, very rarely are there school teachers who are always very good or who are always very mediocre. They sort of, it depends on a host of external factors. And therefore, it's very hard to say that this teacher is this standout teacher consistently through her career. It is, it is true that it's quite possible that you might find a very small percentage 
of very disengaged, very demotivated teachers. But looking at it from a perspective that these are the super teachers, you know, super men, super women who are teaching, that's very hard. So, uh, you know, I think that's a, that's, a, that's a good and interesting indicator, but it's an insufficient uh, reflection of the reality of the teacher population really on the ground. Uh, that's one. The second, uh, on the, the, that comment on well-being, uh, and I think, uh, in a sense, I was alluding to that in my last point, uh, and this is, of course, just one perspective on this matter, which is this, that, uh, you know, I think we need to look at how have we envisioned education? What is the purpose of education in our country? And how are we trying to actually make it come to life? And, and, and at least from a perspective of what's there on paper in my country on education, uh, in a sense, in a sense, uh, the aim of education is to facilitate, to develop well-being. And I think that's uh, very laudatory. Uh, it's just that we're not making it happen. Roger? Uh, one comment, the uh, per student endowment at the City University of New York is 5,000 per student, and at Yale it's 7.5 million per student. So it's kind of difficult to understand how the two experiences would it all be similar in any respect. That is a fact, and uh, that is not going to change. Yep. Okay. Uh, I, I would just wonder what the proper measure of the endowment of City College is, though. <laughs> Might be the tax base of New York, but that's a side issue. Um, let me just make a couple of points, because we're out of time, I guess. Uh, yes, we are. On the question of local schools uh, and funding, I, I do think, especially if you turn to the less developed countries, that's a huge issue. I mean, looking in China, for example, you see huge regional disparities among the 31 provinces. And because precisely, and this was true in Brazil, too, until the, recent, until the government really changed its educational policy and provided more centralized spending. So local finance is, is a real issue. I mean, in Northeast Brazil, you were getting schools that didn't need, where they were meeting in trees and they had no books. So there really was a sense of, that at some low level, not, not the level that Richard's talking about, but we're talking about local finance in some of the less developed countries is serious. And let me just talk to this point that, that Dennis referred to, Dennis Snower referred to, and that is this question about what education does. And Richard more or less answered it. I would just simply say we have some research. We've done some research on exactly what these questions are. And this emphasizes the point that what education is doing, what school's doing, is producing not only these cognitive skills, not only the workplace-based skills, but skills that are useful across all of social life. And in fact, we actually measure that. Looking at several different data sets, we find substantial effects of things like increased trust in society, the ability to sort of engage others, uh, voting, participation in democracy. You find uh, a, a number of dimensions of social participation. So I would argue that if you look at this whole bundle of cognitive and non-cognitive skills, it's not just the vocational skill that's being taught. In fact, there's a great quotation that, uh, uh, that I think goes back to Horace Mann and also uh, Martin Luther King, that the least part of what schools are teaching <laughs> has to do with uh, uh, reading, writing, and arithmetic. A lot more is the kind of lessons of life and promoting it, which would translate into citizenship, which would translate into components. And now we have some measures of that, and we can see some dramatic effects, and also health, what I talked about. Mm -hmm. So that's where I think we just need to kind of open our eyes a little bit more about what education is all about and how we might measure its benefits. But I completely agree with the observation that there's this larger set of uh, outcomes that schools produce. Thanks very much. These are showing double zeros here, so I think let's, uh, I'm supposed to wrap it up. So join me in thanking our panel. ...in the lives of the people. And so I would view it as a policy of pre-distribution, early life distribution. So why is this important? And this is a graph that came out of work with Gene Brooks Gunn, who's working with us in one of the INET initiatives, the HCEO initiative on early childhood. And you can see that if you look at the scores of children who are uh, entering at the college age in the United States, say age 18, and you rank their scores on the basis of the education of their mother, you get a standard finding, which is people from greater advantaged families, more advantaged families are much more likely, the children are much more likely to have high test scores. 
And that's true for cognitive and non-cognitive measures both. This is a cognitive measure. But what's dramatically important is that these test scores that are so predictive in admissions, deciding who goes to college or not, the gaps in those scores are very substantial by age three, certainly poor children enter school. And so those gaps are extraordinarily important in understanding where they come from. Now, 100 years ago, if we'd been talking about this question, I would imagine in Canada and England, eugenics movement would say, okay, this is purely a manifestation of genetics. What you're seeing is the dumb people have uh, dumb kids, smart people have smart kids, and the smart people go to school, so they just propagate. We've come to understand that that's a very limited vision. There is a role for genetics, but we also know there's a huge role for social policy, and I think that's what guides a lot of the work that we're doing in the HCEO network. And I'll give you one example. Many people are concerned about the gaps in American education between blacks and whites and Hispanics and whites. So if you look at the actual gaps, this is about 10 years old, this data, but if, if you look at this, you find that there's a serious deficiency in the percentage of children who are blacks compared to whites entering college. And the same thing is even worse for Hispanics. If you condition on the abilities of those individuals at age uh, 18, then you find that the gaps, because partly of affirmative action policies, other policies, those gaps reverse. And in fact, we're finding substantial uh, uh, benefits of blacks versus whites. So we can see, as, as one of many examples, the important role of these abilities. Now, how are these abilities produced? Now, I talked about genetics. Uh, a lot of people still talk about genetics. I don't want to emphasize that, but we know that family life plays a very important role. I'll give you some very simple examples. So in the American family situation, the U.S. family situation, we see a phenomenon that's been very much remarked on. Increasingly, we see it mentioned in the New York Times and other popular media, but it's been around for many, many years. But what we see is a growing fraction of children who are living in single-parent households. And these are single-parent households in the United States context, which are not very rich in terms of financial resources and in terms of parenting resources. That's the biggest growth sector. And it's phenomenal how this growth. And this is a phenomenon that's actually found around the world. If you go to Taiwan, if you go to Korea, it's a much more limited level in Korea. Chile, you have in Mexico. This is a phenomenon that's global. What are these such environments that children have? Just to give you the simplest finding, it's something that's now been popularized by Hillary Clinton and also other groups recently, a so-called 30 million word gap. It goes back to some early studies by Hart and Risley. If you look at the kind of environments that children from different educational, from different professional backgrounds face, you can see that per hour, there are huge gaps in the verbal environments that children are getting. Professional children are getting exposed to more than 2,000 words per hour. Children from the bottom of, in some sense, of the socioeconomic strata are getting about a third to a fourth of that. And not only is it the quantity of words, it's also the nature of the parenting, which has been shown to be quite important and then that in multiple skills matter, and the sorting of people, the actual use of comparative advantage as people find their ways through life and find the jobs where they can succeed, that I think is an important component, not only for understanding how we create skills, but evaluating programs that are creating skills. And another neglected component, which I mentioned already, but just would emphasize, is that families play a very important role. Families play a role not only in supporting children in schools, but in getting ready for uh, children for school. So that there really is an issue that really needs uh, a broadened conception. So a skills policy also has to consider aspects of families and family life. And that varies across countries and environments, in not only in the United States, within the same country, but across many countries as well, which we'll talk about. A key theme, and Rob has talked about this already, and we'll hear more about it, is the importance of the early years. We know from a lot of work in neuroscience and developmental psychology and epi uh, epidemiology, the early years are very important. And they're more important than we realized maybe 10 or 15 years ago. We have not only a lot of evidence from biology, but we have a lot of evidence as well coming from uh, social science and social science interventions. So the key notion is multiple skills. So you want to think of both cognition and character. Now, character is a word that sometimes is attacked. It suggests a kind of Victorian prudish notion. What I'm talking about as character is a sense of capabilities, the capacities to act, 
the ability to govern one's life, the ability to, to, to act in a variety of different areas in life, to manage one's health, to form, uh, to go to school and so forth. We want to think about these multiple capabilities, multiple measures of cognition, multiple measures of character that are developed from cognition, from conception to birth. And to think about the full life cycle. Instead of focusing just on the early years, or focusing just on, uh, say, charter schools, or focusing just on one segment of the life cycle to the other, or maybe adult health, if we think about treating disease, we really want to try to have a holistic approach that goes across the life cycle and connects the dots. Let me give you, an, give you an example. This is a graph. I'm not going to give you very many, but here's one. If you literally look at studies from social science where you ask, at age 30, what's the probability of being a college graduate? Exactly somebody who's going to contribute to society through, uh, say, college graduation and the set of skills that college graduates uh, contribute to. What we see, and these graphs are in the same format. On the left is cognitive factors. The other are measures of personality or character skills. And what you see as you move from the bottom deciles, which are the lowest levels, to the highest deciles, those people who have higher levels of those abilities are actually much more likely to graduate from college. It's a very steep, uh, it's very sharp gradient that appears in both dimensions. But what's also relevant, and I think is neglected, is that both factors, in some sense, in the sense of the slope of this curve, are equally important. And that, it's, and that these multiple dimensions are a key and neglected component of how we think about uh, evaluating schools and what schools and families produce. And so with these multiple skills, uh, producing them, developing, are going to be a major way to solve problems of economic and social uh, opportunity. And in a phrase that even I used last year, but I would repeat again this year, is that we want to think not just about redistributional policies, which has been the emphasis traditionally when people think about inequality, giving alms to the poor, trying to redistribute goods or a fixed pie. What we're talking about is creating a pie, and at the, a larger pie, and at the same time creating opportunity in doing that. So it's something that actually produces greater economic wealth and simultaneously produces greater opportunity. Of 18 to 24 year olds in the United States are not qualified to be a United States Army private because they either don't have a high school degree they act, lack physical capabilities, asthma, diabetes. They have a criminal record, or they have a persistent uh, drug dependency. This large population of young adults who are not qualified to be United States Army privates are the same people who can't qualify to get jobs in the United States. And why it is that we have a consistent, steady uh, millions of job openings that can't be filled. So when you ask, well, how is the United States doing in its youth human capital production, the quite, you and might as well ask yourself, how many of you would put your money in a bank in which there was a 75% probability in which you wouldn't get the money back? Or how many would you would get into an airplane in which there was a 75% probability? These levels of quality in, of um, lack of quality are not tolerated in any sector except in the youth human capital sector. And one of the things that INET is about, what the, youth, the Human Capital and Economic Opportunity Working Group is about, is to change that in the United States. What's very important from the speakers that you'll hear, particularly um, uh, from India, Anurag Bahar, he will be talking about a population of young people that is larger than the entire population of the United States. The population of people under 25 years old is larger than the entire population of the United States. The voting population of India is larger than the population of the United States and, and, and Europe combined. So as you think about um, what INET is doing, what the Human Capital Economic Opportunity Working Group is doing, think about this enormous pool of human capital in India, obviously China, the rest of the emerging economies. Think about this enormous pool of human capital that is going to be what sustains human society in the decades to come. So let me uh, now ask the panel to come on. Perry, lead them on, and I will get off the stage. Thank you.
Um, no, here, here, let me sit there and you can sit there. Okay. Yeah. And here. Um, well, thanks for that, that setup. There doesn't leave me much to say here. Um, I will just uh, say, remind you that I'm in this industry of, of education and human development. I'm a professor in a liberal arts college, uh, Barnard College, and my thesis students, okay, um, who are watching now, I hope, um, remember that your thesis is due April 21, and you should be working working now developing your human capital. Um, this I think of is actually one of the most high value added pieces of teaching um, that we do, uh, as, a, as a matter of fact. And perhaps we'll come to some of that in the, in the discussion. So I, I'm just admitting, I'm in the selective school part. You'll see why that's, that's relevant when you hear uh, Mr. Benjamin's speech. But let's start it off with Jim Heckman, if you would. Okay, well, thank you very much, Rob and Perry, for the introductions. Uh, I want to talk briefly about framing the question and then broadening the question, as Rob has already mentioned, Perry has mentioned, to consider these issues not just in the context of the United States or North America, but to consider a uh, broader set of contexts. Good afternoon. Thanks for being here this afternoon at uh, a panel which, for many of you, does not seem to be really related to the central focus of INET. But let me just ask you, how many of you have read Martin Wolf's book, Fixing Global Finance? You need to. Midway through the book, Martin Wolf, as he does in many, many things, makes a connection between central bank low interest rate policies and other aspects of economic activity. And what he points out is that low interest rate policies tend to amplify the financial activities of companies where transactions are involved, but results in a, an underinvestment in infrastructure and human capital. If it's indeed the case that human capital has been underinvested in for a long period of time, this may account for a portion of the inequality that is of considerable concern to people in the room. Today, we have a remarkable panel to talk about these issues. Anurag Behar from India, Roger Benjamin, the Council for uh, Aid ed to Education, James Heckman, well-known Nobel Prize winner, um, University of Chicago, Richard Reeves at the Brookings Institution, and the panel will be moderated by Perry, Perry Merleys. I could hand this microphone to any of you in this room and ask you to say a few words about the banking sector. Because you have, this is a familiar concept, you have a lot of vocabulary about it, you could talk for five minutes without problem. If I ask you to do the same thing with respect to the auto industry, it might not be your subject of uh, familiarity, but you could speak for five minutes or so because basically the subject, the product, the uh, issues of automobiles are something you're familiar with. And you understand it as a sector. If I ask you to speak for five minutes about the youth human capital sector, you would um, struggle with ideas about um, education, you might have some things to say about safety, that sort of thing, but you'd basically be unable to talk about the youth human capital sector in the same way that you talk about, the, say, the financial sector. Yet, 18-year-old young adults ready for life are the most important product our society produces. You can't imagine finance or automobiles or any other economic sector functioning for a long period of time. You can't imagine a society without ready for life 18 year olds. It's for this reason that INET has focused a tremendous amount of energy and resources on youth human capital development. The Human Capital Economic Opportunity Working Group with over 400 members worldwide is looking at this question at these questions and this idea of how do you produce 
Ready for Life 18-year-olds. And now the question is, is it a problem? How are we doing? A Defense Department study in 2008 revealed that 75 percent... So I just want to lay out uh, some... Uh, I have, uh, here we are. So what are the challenges? And this is the challenge that uh, INET is addressing in a number of sessions and in different aspects. The challenges are basically economic inequality and a divided society. We know this is a graph that has actually gone around the world. Uh, it's turned up again since the 2008 meltdown. And we know that there's been a huge amount of growth of inequality in the society. But the question is, what should we do about it? And what are the appropriate policies? Now, the main point, and something that Rob already referred to, is that inequality is partly driven, not all exclusively driven. We know that there are important components of financial markets, other trends going on in technology and so forth. But skills is a huge component. And the question is how we can actually solve the skills problem, the very problem that Rob uh, very carefully discussed. This is a graph that I've drawn, uh, constructed, used in previous work on the uh, uh, production of skills in the American economy, the US economy. And namely, we've seen a very interesting phenomenon that until around 1950, we had a steady growth in every cohort. This is birth cohort on the bottom axis and the uh, completion rate on the, on the y, y axis, the uh, ordinate. And uh, what we see is that every cohort up to around 1950 was more likely to go to school graduate high school, graduate college as well. And then starting for cohorts born after around 1950, there was a real slowdown. Now it's true at a high level, 80%, but more alarmingly, we've actually seen a decline in the economy uh, in terms of the percentage of high school graduates uh, starting in the late uh, 1970s, 1980s. And so this question about where the skilled labor are coming from, where the economy is gonna actually build itself and how we're gonna actually grow, is, uh, is the serious issue. Meanwhile, college graduation has been going up, although this is primarily driven by more women going to college, and the male graduation rate has not really changed all that much since the 1950s, the early 60s. So what we need to think about, and what this session will talk about in part, is a comprehensive approach to skills development. And I think that's what we need to think about in a way that usually is not framed in public policy discussions. And the crucial thing, and I think this is the most important thing I can leave you with, is that the kind of typical discussion of public policy for skills uh, is, is, doesn't work, the fragmented approach. So the obvious solution, for example, to promote skills is to put money in schools, maybe chartered schools, maybe trying to fix the high schools. What we want to understand is that skill formation is a much more general process, involves many other institutions and actors in societies, it involves families, it involves workplaces, it involves a much more integrated framework than we typically think about. And so much public policy is really sort of treating, treating the problem one, one solution at a time. So if we're gonna try to promote health, we're gonna try to have better doctors or better hospitals. That's part of the solution, but we need to think more comprehensively about an integrated solution. And I wanna talk about that. And this, by the way, is relevant not just in the United States, but to India, to China, and to many other situations. And so the question is, broadly thinking, what do we know about skills and how they're produced? And I think the main lesson comes that we want to invest in prevention. So again, success depends on having a right bundle of skills. And notice the word is plural. It's not just a single skill. It's not just being smart. Even though many books have been written about how high IQ people are they gonna win and all the other, the dummies are gonna drop out, the world is much more complicated